Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to 182 Books. I'm Anthony Allen. I'm um, at Paula Cooper Gallery and also a big fan of the bookstore. Um, if you have even the slightest interest in modern and contemporary art and art history, if you've read even just a smattering of lines published in that field, there's a good chance that uh, some of those lines were written by Yves Lambois, and they were the lines that stayed with you. Um, I'm alluding both to Bois's capacious scope of inquiry, since he's an expert on artists as wide ranging as Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian, Malevich, Barnett Newman, Martin Barre, Robert Rauschenberg, Ed Rouchet, and Ellsworth Kelly, and also to his distinctive authorial voice, one that is rigorous and incisive, refreshingly unafraid of frank evaluations because frank evaluations are, after all, ethical and political positions, and also personal, humorous, and there I say the word without sounding sentimental, passionate. It is no exaggeration to say that Bois scholarship is, has not only altered the contours of his field, but also transcended it to have an impact on other disciplines, particularly literature, which is where I first encountered him through the incredible exhibition, um, Formless, A User's Guide, which is an exhibition at the Centre Pompidou who, that he curated with Rosalind Krauss, um, whose uh, tutelary spirit was Georges Bataille and whose catalog literally changed everything in my cloistered world. Um, and so one of the pleasures of this new oblique autobiography published by No Place Press, shout out to the triumvirate of Rachel Turner, Jordan Cantor and Jeff Kaplan, um, yes, um, is the ability to trace the intellectual encounters that contributed to shape Bois' identity as a scholar. From the early mentors like Roland Barthes, Jean Clay, and Hubert Damisch, to the, the friends, artists, and co colleagues Bois met along the way, Rosalind Krauss and the other October critics, of course, but also Ligia Clark, Robert Klein, David Medalla, and others. If your interest lies not just in the field of modernism and postmodernism, but also in following the through line of an intellectual autobiography with all its meanders, its cautionary tales, I'm thinking of the Picabia essay, which reads like a crime novel, um, its re renunciations and reconciliations, this book is for you. Here to discuss these meanders with us is Leah Dickerman, uh, who like Yvalin serves on the editorial board of October. Leah is Director of Research Programs at the Museum of Modern Art and also had a long curatorial career at MoMA's Department of, in MoMA's Department of Painting and Sculpture and previously at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Her recent exhibitions at MoMA, uh, Robert Rauschenberg in 2017, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series in 2015, Inventing Abstraction in 2012, and the Bauhaus exhibition of 2009 have all been memorable and extraordinarily enriching. All this to say, we're in for a treat. Um, we're live streaming this event and recording it, um, so you'll be able to access it again and share it soon. Um, we'll take a few questions at the end of the talk, um, and you'll be able to get a copy of the book and uh, discuss further with Yvala after we're done. And now, without further ado, further ado, please join me in welcoming Yves Lambois and Leah Dickerman. So this is an intimate affair, which is great because that means we can all ask questions of Eva La. And as you might imagine, preparing for this talk made me think about my own relationship with him. Um, I'm not his student. Um, I'm Benjamin Buclo's student. His non Eva La's Bois students are among my most esteemed and dearest friends and colleagues. Um, but your work has been profoundly important for me um, and your friendship is dear. And so certainly when I write my own oblique autobiography, um, there will be a chapter in it about you. And in offering a preview about this, I realized that I can't remember when we met. Um, so we're off to a poor <laughs> start. Um, but what I do, uh, what I do remember, is the complete revelation of reading your essay on Lizitsky and radical reversibility, 
which came out in 1988, um, sitting in the library at Columbia, uh, reading it for the first of many times, and how this work helped me think about um, a perceptual approach to the Russian avant-garde and even um, to thinking about Alexander Rochenko's radical oblique. And then when painting as model came out in 1990, that felt like a manifesto to me, a manifesto about how you could imagine a formalism that was open form as a historical fact, as ideological, as a kind of tactics. And since then, I've been lucky to have you as a colleague on the October editorial board. And that's not been a short time. I've been on the board since 2001. But I feel like I'm just beginning to understand the complex of motivations and relationships um, that have bought, brought the journal into being and continue its mandate and missions. Um, they're just being revealed to me now. And so with one last memory, at least for today, uh, of teaching a co-seminar, that I taught with Hal Foster um, at Princeton on Rauschenberg. Um, Eva Lan joined us for a few classes, bringing each time a little grocery store box of sushi as lunch <laughs> to the utter delight um, of our joint students. So uh, today I have 10 questions for you. Um, <laughs> And the first is about the idea of the autobiography. So a reader of many of your texts will know how you rail against too much stress on biographical tendencies. So perhaps it's unusual, um, a surprise, that you would want to write an autobiography, even an oblique one. And so how did you come to the idea of some kind of self accounting in published form? So I didn't want to write an autobiography. Um, I was making piles of essays to to concoct volumes. So like a volume on Mondrian, a volume on Picard, grabbing all the essays I would have. And that was, I was preparing this volume on, on non-composition. Anyway, I was just making piles, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Not that I was really intending to really work on that, but and I, I noticed that there were all these essays that didn't fit in into any of those piles, and had nothing in common except me. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and I remember this awful book called Myself by um, a colleague of Rosalind at MIT, um, <laughs> Wayne Anderson. This, this is like. Not what I want to do, <laughs> but there were there was this pile of, of things, and I I had been invited to the extraordinary symposium at Villa Itati uh, three four years ago, which was called Scholarly Vitae, and we were there were fourteen speakers uh, or whatever. It was not a, it was not a public event; it was totally private. So we were told we could be as <coughs> free uh, as could be because it would not be published. So. And uh, we were asked to speak about something that changed our way of dealing our work and whatever, a kind of intellectual encounter. It could be a person, it could be a text, it could be a work of art, whatever. And it was the most interesting symposium I ever heard. It was so, because we had all these, um, you know, buildings run, run mm -hmm. by all these people. And I, I thought, and everyone was very interested, like every, you know, there was there were the fellows at it, you know, like fourteen speakers plus about fourteen people in the audience. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> and um, and it, yeah, it, it was uh, like today. Yeah. No, it was fascinating, and so I and the fact that everyone was fascinated, and I was fascinated. Well, maybe there is something really interesting in in general to uh, to have a kind of encounter of you know, an well, others in intellectual. Because, you know, what's, uh, what's the, how is, one is formed, you know, it is, I, I was struck by the general, the general interest in this topic. So I was with this um, <coughs> collection of essays that, as I said, had no other connection than me. And I realized, well, if I make a scrapbook like that, with all these things, 
maybe that would be exactly the same thing, and maybe people would be interested. And of course, I was interested to kind of find out who I was by, mm -hmm. through this indirectly, because it's one of the things that it's, you know, you get a sense of who I became slowly, because it goes by in reverse chronological order. But you, um, you, you, what I didn't want is people having a sense of narrative of like a kind of um, a kind of uh, theological, you know. Yeah, to the degree that there's a chronology <coughs> to the book, it goes backwards. Yeah, the, the the first text published in the book is the last it, it, text I published in reverse chronological order of their first publication. So the text that Anthony was mentioning about Picabia is a text that's last in the book, and it's a text from 1966, 76. So it's like almost half a century away. But that was the first published originally, and it's the last in that book. So it's, it goes And so there are a series of encounters with these formative figures. There's art historians, and there's philosophers and artists. Um, there's also a few pieces on journals, and one or two yeah. on museums. Um, so in each case, there's an encounter. Um, and sometimes, it starts with a memory of how you met someone and these, these first meetings often take emphasis in a kind of um, encounter. Um, but it felt to me as I was reading it that this ultimately felt like a book about love. Um, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> <coughs> what, what, I do, what, what I should say is that every text is published, not all of them, but because some of it's not necessary because some of the texts have a, a direct autobiographical character. Not not many, but some. So most of the texts have a little introduction written to, to, with that's a, the me of today, right? right? So I wanted to make, I wanted to be, that it would be clear to the reader that the person who writes a small introduction <coughs> is very different or sometimes very different from the person who wrote the text. That, that, because it, there is a kind of multiplicity of, you know, of I. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the person who says I in the little short introduction, any of the text is not the same. Mm -hmm. I wanted that to be clear. Mm -hmm. So you choose the word oblique yeah. to choose this form of uh, narrative. And in this context, I'm interpreting that to mean that you figure obliquely um, in these texts, but the word oblique is a particularly meaningful one to you, and you address it in your career in many ways. And would you speak about the mm. meaning of that word? Um, uh, it's, well, indirect, certainly. Uh, <laughs> not, not perpendicular. <laughs> <coughs> not frontal. Um, you know, as you know, I've worked, uh, and I should have published that book long ago, but I never did, uh, on axonometry for a while, which is a, an oblique projection, not centered. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah, it has all, all kinds of connotations of that sort. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the not frontal and not perpendicular is probably, so not oppositional and not, you know, mm -hmm. um, is probably the most... Uh, the biggest connotation that he does for me. There's, there's also, I mean, this is one of the through lines of your writing is that there's also a critical assault on essentialist and linear narratives. Mm. You, I mean, it's true here, but also in some of your other books. Um, and here you speak about um, critically of that inevitable evolution of the art of painting to its end or um, understanding modernism as a conflict, a conquest of flatness. So that was, a, yeah. There was, I mean, that was the you know, kind of fairly standard criticism of Greenberg. But uh, but you know, I, mean, I had to go through that too. But, uh, That's actually a big question that I have for you, Evelyn. Okay, so um, so you speak critically about certain kinds of essentializing modernist discourses, yeah. and that's been a big bugaboo throughout your writing. Um, and the target has often been this kind of hyper valorization of Greenberg in the US. And you have a deep interest in Russian formalism um, for looking as form as a historical fact and an interest in 
form that's ideological and you're interested in defamiliarization and you're interested in journals that are multilingual and diasporic like De Stijl and I-10. And then in another moment, you speak about modernism in terms of the conceptual unities on which it's founded. Um, originality, a notion of, of stylistic coherences. So that notion of modernism to me has nothing to do with how you actually talk about modernism when you're talking about I-10 or De Stijl or Mondrian. So I wonder, I don't know, do you have a working definition of modernism that huh. you could share with us? Wow. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, at least, <laughs> no, I mean, I have one that is kind of easy, you know, it's, you, I, and, you, and I can see why it could, it could very easily be folded back into Greenberg definition, but basically it's reflexivity, you know, mm -hmm. every which is why, you know, in literature, it, it basically for someone like me, it starts with Mallarmé, you know, and, uh, uh, in, in, in any uh, art that is, but it's, but of course, there's always something that can happen before. I mean, Leo Steinberg once told me, never say something as the first time. Yeah. <laughs> because someone will always find another first time before. So, but you know, and uh, what, what I can say is that one of the reasons I, I always had doubt about the concept of postmodernism is because it didn't seem to me that postmodernism, what the people who were, were speaking about their work as postmodern, were going doing something very different in terms of the in terms of reflexivity they, they were it was a you know code within a code alluding to and that you know and i remember when reading the james um, jameson's first major essay and he was describing you know things and, and you know if duchamp is postmodern and then you know maybe piranese is postmodern i mean what does that mean you know it, it kind of lost the 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 its definition for me, modern. So I say, an easy, an easy, an easy um, definition of of modernism would be an art that is self-reflective, okay, that doesn't consider its language to be transparent, but uh, to have a you know, to have a, a body mm -hmm. that has its codes and, and its uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all its diff diff you know variation possible variations within the within a system. Um, I mean, it's not a very elaborate definition. It's kind of banal. But, uh... Uh, uh, I'm going to come back to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that comes through in this book is how incredibly young and determined <laughs> you are. Um, from well, not early... anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're a young teenager when you... Um, <laughs> sort of make um, enough money to make your way to Paris um, to look at art. You are maybe 17 when you go to America as an exchange student and wind up in rural Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, not over PA. <laughs> you're 18 when you meet Leisha Clark. You're 19. No, I was, uh, no, I was 16 in the division. <laughs> <laughs> You're 19 or so when you join the seminars of Art and Damish. That's true. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it happened, but it did. Well, you know, in thinking about myself a long time ago and in, in having children, and you've had the experience of having children as well, this seems like an unusual amount of um, determination and sense of quest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's bizarre. I, mean, I don't know what I must say is that uh, my parents had absolutely zero interest. Or, or, I mean, they were not against art, but they that was not part of their culture at all. But they were very encouraging, and so you know, it's it's. I was giving, I was going to Paris by myself at age fourteen just to do that. So I, I I was living in Toulouse. Take, you know, make little jobs to get money to pay for the train. I would go, and it was a, there was a lot of vacation for for school for you know for school <coughs> children in France. So you know, quite a lot. So every time there was a vacation, I would go to Paris. I, I would just stay at my uncle mm -hmm. uh, and and my aunt. And uh, the code was that I would go. I could go during the day, do all 
museums, gallery, whatever, all that. But then the coda had to to be to be uh, back home for for dinner. Mm. And the reason I met Jean Clay is because you know I was a young painter and I brought my ca carton to yeah. show to Denise René who was like the you know abstraction geometric abstraction and op art uh, gallerist in, in Paris and I went to the Rue La Boétie where the gallery was and Denise was not there but his, her sister was there mm -hmm. so she told me oh but you know she would be very happy to meet you and we heard so much about you I, I, I have no idea how, but you know, tonight we are inaugurating our gallery space in, in Rive Gauche, the second gallery space. And so you could, you should come, you know, we're having this dinner, uh, this uh, opening, you should come. And so I come back to my aunt and uncle and I tell them, and my uncle said, absolutely not. <laughs> so, oh, and my aunt, who knew Jean Clay, she, because they worked in the same journal said to my uncle, you know, Jean will be, probably be here. But my uncle didn't like Jean Claire at all because, he, you know, they, they were, they, there's, I think uh, my aunt and him had something, you know, thing. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, so the, the deal was if, if, um, if Jean would be at the opening, uh, my uncle would, would, uh, would just, you know, pass the baton and he would be in charge of making sure I don't get you know, abducted. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where I met Jean Claire. Yeah. So my, my, <laughs> my curiosity is about this adolescent Yvonne uh, and what you understood yourself to be in search of. Well, I wanted to be an artist. Uh -huh. yeah. So you were sure that was an artist. I wanted to be, uh, yeah, I wanted to be, you know, I mean, I had this uh, complete... Uh, fascination for Mondrian, even though I had not seen a single work by Mondrian at the time, it was just this awful book by Michel Zuffer. And, uh, you know, that, and, <laughs> and, you know, I was fascinated by that. And I wanted to, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, and so I was unbelievably, I don't know, culotté, as we say in French, you know, I mean, I don't know how, but I just like, I would just call people. Mm. Artist, and they had never seen it like 14, 15, 16 year old just ring, you know, ring there. And so they were kind of, <laughs> kind of amazed. And you know, mor morally, I met the same morally the same day as I met John Clay, the same evening. And I saw him uh, again. I never saw him again until 30 years later. And he recognized me instantly. And I was, how is it possible? Mm. And he said, Aha, but you know, you were quite, you know, we thought. If that's the new generation, we won. Yeah. And, and typical moralism, but let me assure that didn't last very long. <laughs> so, so I, you know, but no, I, I, what I was saying is the fact that my parents gave me a complete confidence and, you know, amazing. said that was really, that's probably what helped, you know, so, yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. They only they only said that you can't, you can't do everything because you know, I was learning the violin. I wanted to be you know I wanted to do, you have to choose. You can't do too too many things. So, so you you pared down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that comes through in reading about these early years in Paris is that there are a sense of two great avant-garde's coming together. So you have this moment of really <coughs> great critical theory um, that's represented by Damish and by Bart, but there's also a really amazing group of artists around you, around Lija Clark, um, many of them South American artists who are in Paris, in, and, and you are the bridge between this body of critical theory and these practicing artists and Sometimes, no, I don't. I don't want to, you know. But uh, you know, all the all the um, the South American artists I, I met basically through Jean Clay, mm -hmm. and uh, and Jean at the time was, you know, his um, his uh, practice, his idea, his his philosophical base was basically Sartre, and you know, I was a student of Bart, um, and you know. Sartre had been very, very nasty about structuralism and all this kind of thing. So I, I gradually moved Jean. I brought him to the seminar of Damish. I gradually moved him, changed, you know, in a way his, his ideological, you know, foundation. The thing that didn't disappear because I also liked it was Belo Ponti. That was fine. Mm. But uh, so 
<coughs> in Livia, <coughs> we talked a lot about uh, about things to read, and and you know she was she was um, uh, an avid reader, but only of certain things. She read a lot of psychoanalysis, but only a certain ty type of psychoanalysis. She didn't read Lacan. She mm -hmm. read uh, you know the the group of La, La Planche Pontalis. What she what she liked the best was this um, uh, Gordek kind of uh, dissident. Uh, <laughs> She, uh, she was fascinated by Grodek, and the group of Laplanche and Pontalis had published in, in his journal, they published a, uh, a text called uh, The Soul of the Belly, of the, uh, of the you know, du ventre, Lame du Ventre in, in French. And Ligia was fascinated by it. She, just, she knew it almost, it was a long, complicated essay, she knew it almost by heart. There is some sense to me as a reader, though, this moment of coming together between a critical praxis. Mm and a form of historical criticism um, and that that's what's really exciting mm. um, in a moment that these things are not just happening separately no no but that sure. they're coming together in a space and in the world that you're um inhabiting mm. and i wonder what you can say about the relationship between those two interests because it sounds like you're running from the salons mm. of I mean, the seminars to uh, Lisa Clark's apartment, or I'm not sure if I have the chronology right exactly, but you're. Well, Lisa left. Uh, she left definitely in 1976. So that's basically the. She left shortly after the first. Uh, no, the but first. You're still in the seminars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just stopped. But it was. Uh, mm. um, it was just after the first issue of, of, of Macula, and uh, no, the the. <coughs> but before that, uh, yes, I would go from from Art Seminar to Ligia. I mean, she was she she was in. Yeah, I saw her almost almost every day for five years. So, um, but uh, but there was also uh, other artists who were interested. In, and, you know, there was this young French artist who was basically my age uh, called Christian Bonnefoy, who was very important mm -hmm. the theoretically for the journal. Uh, he was a very close to Martin Barre, who was a man who didn't talk much. But um, what he said was always extraordinary to the point. He didn't talk much except when he, when he was decided to be sarcastic, and then he was very funny. But, uh, but uh, no, he, he was, uh, he, and he was interested in theory. Mm. And they were all interested in theory. Uh, that's true. And, uh, I mean, it, 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 this moment of the early 70s, in terms of the, the critical discourse that was happening at the time, I don't think, you know, because everyone was reading the same thing, like a book by Foucault would appear, everyone would read it. It was just normal that you would read it, whatever you were, or a new book by Bart, you know, there was, this was a kind of, just by the, the kind of, you knew that these people were reading the same book, because they were, it's, uh, and because you were discussing it. I don't think it's, it's, it doesn't happen that often. There was this kind of, uh, you know, agitation in the air that was, you know, that's something I really miss, I must say. Um, so one of the things I really love is the description of your two great mentors, um, Damish and Bart. Um, and you describe them as two perfectly complementary guides um, with much in common, the same enemies, the same structuralist past, the same capacity to make their inquiry relevant, relevant but at the same time, very different. Um, and I wonder if you could paint these pictures uh, for us a little bit and talk about how each of these seminars impacted you. Um, <coughs> and also, what did you take from each? How can you trace that in your own work? And what did you leave behind? Oh, well, that's, I don't think one is ever completely judge of that. Um, um, well, I could I could say that they were in, indeed very very different. Um, they were both extraordinarily generous, but in a very 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 different manner. Um, Danish was always wanting to connect things, mm -hmm. so uh, his, his, his seminar was usually he would speak for about an hour and then it would be discussions and on. sometimes someone would present something but very rarely and um but he, when he would speak it would be a, you know a kind of avalanche of bibliography you know, you know just like on, on and you would know it, like, why is he speaking about that thing at that particular moment you know that it was and 
he was also reading quite a few la different languages, so he would just, you know, suddenly just put a Tafuri, or no one knew what whatsoever what, what, what Tafuri was at the time in France, and so you was like, you know, trying to say, who is this guy, Tafuri? And it would, but it would be 20 books per sp or, or 20 articles or whatever. I mean, it was, it was this constant... Uh, uh, torrential information, always marginal to to no, not always marginal, but you would never have thought about you know uh, of making this connection. You know, like going to a seminar in the bar house, and then suddenly this you know seventy page of anal Marxist analysis of I don't know the Weimar structure. And you know, did you know why he was making this connection? No, you you would you would understand, but that, but it would take a while, and, and it was always wow. <laughs> you know, and and he had also the capacity to, to in a text that you knew, uh, to just uh, it, uh, it's something that he picked up, I think, a lot from Derrida too, you know, to to point to something that is completely unnoticeable, but is actually, you know, essential. The Damish was very good at that. So, so he, he taught you to do that in a way. Um, but, you know, in a, in a, in a very... Um, I, would, I can't find a word. It was a bombardment. That's what you felt. Very different. Bart was also very generous, but it's, it was um, in showing hesitations, in showing uh, how failure is important, how you, if you don't manage to articulate something, well, maybe there's something that is resisting articulation. What does that mean? I mean, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So... And even and and um, I remember once um, here's a poor guy who made a presentation. I never made a slightest presentation at Bath, and I was this very rash teenager, but I was a completely shy student, both in Bath <laughs> seminar and, and and didn't intervene much at all. But um, there was there was this guy who made, he wanted to present something, and Bath said yes, and so the guy was making something on on Jean Arp's poetry, and and um, and. Um, Bart is uh, at the same relationship to poetry than I do. Maybe it's a Huguenot background. Very difficult, <laughs> very difficult relationship to poetry. Anyway, and Arp's poetry, Arp's poetry. I don't know about Arp. If there are, yeah, I have no judgment. Basically, about these things. So, the 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 this poor presentation was terrible. It was everyone was like, oh, when is he going to stop? And and Bart, you know. Instead of saying, you know, well, this is really, you know, he said, well, you know, um, I think that you overlooked, uh, you know, I think that maybe, yeah, poetry is is essential for art, but maybe it's not poetry itself. Maybe it's the fact that he wrote in two different languages, and he had two first names, and he had two, you know, like, so, and he was a plastician, and you know, he had maybe someone was a completely bifocal personality, and you know, it's not, you know, <laughs> just like he just like, was just fascinating, you know. And also, I remember from, you know, one of the things that happened in his seminar was that every, well, because that's the rule at the Ecole des Études, you, you cannot repeat a seminar. You, you have to teach what you're doing, your own research. So every seminar led to a long article or a book. Mm. And sometimes, you know, for example, there was, I remember the, the most, the, the one I remember the most clearly was a seminar that led to, later to um, Fragment du Discours Amoureux. Uh, there was a, for about a month and a half, we read two texts by Freud. Mm -hmm. And one was, um, became famous around that same time because uh, 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 Jean-François Jean Lyotard wrote about it and, and other people, which called uh, A Child is Beaten. Mm -hmm. But another one is, is was not known at all at the time. It was translated by a friend of Bart for the occasion, was called something like A Case of Paranoia that that denies the, or that criticizes the, the psychoanalytic theory, text by Freud. And so we read those texts and it was, you know, it, some of them are, very, some part of it are quite technical. And, and about, <laughs> you know, it was a lot of work. And uh, I think about, it was must have, it was more than a month. Bart said, well, that's it. We, yeah, it's not helpful. 
And so, like, you know, we had been spending all this time trying to say something intelligent about this tax. And then that's it. It's not real. And, everyone, and there was a Brazilian student with, I, mean, I can't never, I can't remember his name, but his face, where he had a huge mouth. Like, oh, Roland, tu peux pas nous faire ça? <laughs> and, he, and he said, you know, that's, that's one of the lessons of, of writing. Just, uh, you, you, um, you know, you, Accumulate a lot of things, and uh, and then you you decide there are things that are not not good. You spoke of a little bit of um, bittersweet reluctance to uh, cede your place um, in Bart's seminar yeah. when you realized um, yeah. that it was time. Yeah, well, yeah, I would be. I'd been lucky. I've been there for like I think three years or three years and a half or something. But yeah. it made me wonder a very sort of. Um, pedestrian question is like how in that system do they decide you're done like how do you um, um get a degree finish up uh, yeah you do <laughs> <laughs> i had to finish i had to write a dissertation it was terrible but uh, yeah. i had to you know there was a, there was a job that was available and bart called me and said you know you have to finish your dissertation i'd not written one word and uh, no, it's not true. I'd written one chapter, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, "Well, you know, there's that's a senior. They want someone from the Ecole. They want someone who does um, modern art. And there was a third condition which I forgot, and I was the only one that sort of met those criteria. Yeah. So uh, I finished my dissertation. I wrote my dissertation in speed time, which is, you know, that's why I'm very happy. It's totally inaccessible <laughs> 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 in, <laughs> in some vaults in the Sorbonne." <laughs> Well, the talk, someone told me that they read it. And who is that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, yeah, I, I, you, you do have it. But I did, I stopped going to the seminar way before, I, well, two years before I finished the dissertation. So you spoke too in the book about how after Bart died, um, you suddenly saw him with a new kind of distance, yeah. but also realized that some of the phrases that you yeah. were using or thoughts that you had even thought were yours yeah. really had their origins yeah, it's true. with him. And I guess that made me wonder a little bit about Damish yeah. and how you felt um, the trace of Damish. Hmm. Well... It's a bit. It's it's. It's very different, actually. Um, but I think that um, some of the structuralist devices of Bart, I come, I, I inherited more from the mission from Bart himself. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at the system, see where is exception. Mm -hmm. What what doesn't work because it's the exception that, which. Mm -hmm. That tells, tell, explains the rule, which is why Freud uh, wrote on people who are sick. Um, you know, so that Bart would not think really that way. So it's more like this kind of this kind of things that I. I mean, yeah, that's what I would say. The the, the structuralist um, uh, mode of inquiry that normally you'd think I, I would need it from Bart, but I, when I met Bart, he was already moving away from structural. Yeah. I thought a little bit about that when you, in another essay, um, I'm forgetting which of the essays it was, you come to Harold Bloom writing oh. about the anxiety of influence. Um, and the way that he talks about influence is a kind of creative yeah. misreading. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering to what extent that kind of um, creative misreading under applies the, to Bart, yeah. Well, your, to your relationship with to, Bart, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, I, I may have make fun in the in the book about about influence because it's a it's a concept I truly detest and Bart, mm -hmm. and my detest of this detestation of this concept was influenced by Bart <laughs> <laughs> because he, he that's what he said. I hate influences. So. Um, yeah, so, so. <coughs> but no, it, it's it's. Um, yeah, yeah, creative misreading. That's uh, that's uh, you know, we are, I mean, my Bart is not the same as I don't know, Denis Bart, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, it's uh, we all we all interpret differently, the you know, and we 
misinterpret differently, otherwise there would be no no, no friction. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's actually a small handful of artists that really occupy your attention. Um, well, I want to, I want to, okay. I want to preface something about that about the book. It was clear from the very beginning that it would not be a big illustrated book. It was like a, you know, it's, you know, it's not a small book, but it's not. And and a lot of essays that I've written uh, over the years were for catalog of exhibitions, and a lot of them need to be read a huge amount of images because they are direct comments. Right, so, right, right. so it was not going to be that, which means that it left a lot of. Uh, a lot of text away. I mean, it was, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So the, the the texts that are that are gathered there are particular. Are texts about artists that have been very close to me for for a period, sometimes for a very long time, uh, <coughs> and and that do not necessitate a lot of images. So maybe my question doesn't hold, but I'm going to give it a try mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Which is that if we think about these artists who occupy your attention. Um, and I'm adding, you know, Mondrian and Matisse in the background, but in sure. the book, uh, Kelly and Lisa Clark and Christian Bonafoy and Martin Barre and um, maybe I'm forgetting one. Yeah, in the dark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you see a commonality in these figures of your attention? Well, they were all interested in, in you know, theoretical matters that's mm -hmm. true in one way or the other some of them were more opposed to the art world than others so that's not a community that's different <laughs> uh, they were they were all totally uninterested in you know well, that's, that's not true either. <laughs> but they, they were distant from the from the gallery complex and all that. There was there was not they they considered all of them considered their work as research. Mm -hmm. They had the, the you know. Uh, I remember when they discovered that uh, Streminski and Cope had given all their work to the museum in Poland because they considered their work as research and not you know, and they were all fascinated. Like I mentioned discussing that with with you know all of them, mm -hmm. and they were fascinated by this idea. So that's the common, that's the notion. This you know, research. It's not a very. I mean, I remember one of the book that um, one of the artists I wrote to in, when I was in Pennsylvania. I wrote then I wrote to American artists, and now those letters have been found in archives. But you know, I wrote to Albers, and um, one of the things that he sent me was his book called "Search versus Research," a beautiful book of his three three lectures he had given unbelievably beautifully produced and you know that's that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I see in common with that's with interesting. Artists. Um, so then you came to the United States and can you say something about the shift in the cultural field when you came to the United States mm, uh, <laughs> well well I came in, yeah, I came to replace someone for for one one year and then I, and then I was asked to stay so I you know I didn't have a lot of I mean I'd, I'd come to America when I was 17 I stayed one year in this farm and came a couple of times to New York and I was fascinated and I wanted to come back but I was poor you know there was no way it was going to happen so then finally you know five years later or six years later or I can't count very well but you know I'm asked to come to as a visiting associate Professor, sure, and um, I had a completely. I was totally shocked by the f the fact that at that time, the American academic system was lamentably, you know, there was really very very few things in in major universities about 20th century art. I mean, there was. CUNY because of Rosalind. Mm -hmm. There was nothing at Yale. Nothing. Yale. It was uh, Bob, Bob Herbert would do one one course on on Leger every five years, something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was nothing at Princeton. Nothing at Harvard. Nothing at UCLA. I mean, it was it was absolutely extraordinary. There was nothing. So I had imagined that because of MoMA dating since prehistory, because of all these things, there would be all this, you know, 
all these scholars in major universities teaching modern art. And no, that was like, that was a big discovery. Remember that 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 had actually totally surprised me. Things have changed. No, they certainly have. The weight of the field. So one of your biggest encounters then when you came to the United States, although it sounds like you met in Paris, was with Rosalind. Sure. Um, and you did a bit of a portrait of Macula as a journal. Um, and I guess I wondered, as, because I would like to see it now, you know, how you would describe the October um, that you joined in that moment of time and how you understood it. Well, we felt uh, uh, definitely an affinity. Mm -hmm. In fact, we met uh, at the house of uh, Jean-Claude Lemonstein, and I think we decided to make an... I think October number one and Macula number one had, had just appeared, and we decided to start a, a publicity, of, you know, exchange of publicity right away. It took a, took a while for MIT, whatever. It took a while, but uh, we did for, for a couple of issues. It was, uh, so, uh, you know, we felt it... Um, there was a kind of some, you know, I mean, October was extraordinary Francophile. Uh, it still is, but it was even more then. Um, and we were extraordinary American, Americanophile. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a good exchange. Mm -hmm. We decided to introduce, you know, I mean, for all I say against Greenberg, we did publish quite a few things by Greenberg, but not the way people think. Like, for example, we published all the texts by Greenberg on, on Pollock which is a set that is very different to what, what from what you think. He really he changed completely his position on, on Pollock. At first, for example, he doesn't like the all over. He really doesn't like it whatsoever. Uh, you know, at first he sees the, the, the great, uh, you know, the impasto gooey of the pre-drip. He thinks it's that's a real Pollock. And then he, and it's, he, it's, it's really, he relates that to cubism, to collage. You know, and then he completely shifts, and Pollock becomes, for him, the you know doing mirage and you know pure opticality. It's, it's all it's it, there is a complete arc in his text on Pollock from, from 1945, his first text I think, until he dies. And we found it that fascinating that you know this uh, this historical transformation of someone just discovering. So we I you know I thought it was very you know so that's. The, that's it. Was we, we did publish Winberg, but not as you know, the, the, this is a saint that, uh, mm -hmm. but as someone that is that is you know, that evolves and then changes, mm -hmm. and that you know, that's uh, so. Well, you know, well, I lost my train of thought, but um, um, yes, we, there, there, was, there was this kind of immediate re re reciprocity be, between them. We translated uh, Rosalind uh, fairly early on. And, 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 uh, and she translated me also. <laughs> I think the first text uh, this, this was a little text on Lisitsky that published in, uh, was published in in uh, in, um, in October first, and then my text on Bart. I think. Yeah. We're getting near the end of my list of questions, but the idea of <laughs> exhibition as research is something not surprisingly that resonates with me, and I'm wondering what. Um, exhibition making as a framework um, enables for you, not just in terms of the discoveries of objects that one might make, but what about the experience of exhibition making as a framework for thought? What is your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, when you do an exhibition, I mean, for an exhibition to exist, it has to have, you know, something new, otherwise, what, what it's, you know, what's the point? And the artworks are not made to travel around the world and all this kind of thing. So, um, and so because you want to have a discourse uh, that is not necessarily a linguistic discourse, can be a discourse just by a pure association, but nevertheless, it has to do something new. And because of that, you have to articulate it. So, and, uh, so for example, at the moment, I'm thinking this pro project of a big exhibition on impasto. That if if it happens would be in, in in three different museums in the Louvre, the Musée d'Orsay, and the Pompidou, right. and you have to. So why are you doing impasto? Well, you know why not? First of all, and and you know what's the character is the main characteristic of impasto from the point of view of you know, 
it it cannot be photographed. So it cannot be photographed. You just you know unless you have very very good details by a very talented photographer. You know in reproductions you don't see that. So it means that you do an exhibition for the sheer purpose of making sure that people look at objects from close. So you have to articulate what's different between, let's say, Titian, uh, Van Gogh, and uh, Richter. You know what it's making me think about? <laughs> is the moment in which you're talking about Picasso and pens. Yeah. You yeah. know, and thinking about thickness. Yeah, is yeah. how you're... True. Uh, so that's what, it, you know, you think about, it, okay, this object is has been important for painters for you know, since Titian, uh, but th there has never been any discourse about it, really. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, that's uh, so that's what that's and it's you you can of course you can write about it, but it the really the purpose is to force people to realize that they have to look at things from close, and that cannot be made by any other means than an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So it's, my final question, my mm -hmm. final question for you, Ivalan, before we let everyone else in the room ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, is that this is a book that's very much about people who have been formative for you, about your mentors often, um, but you are distinguished as well um, as a teacher, um, and you have an extraordinary um, crew mm. of students who... Well, I've been blessed. No. Uh, blessed is a one, one way to think about it, but another way to think about it is is the sort of other half, the next book, of, you know, <laughs> the other half of, of, of your project. Um, and I just wonder what you think about the relationship in your head between those who are your teachers and those who are your students. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's hard to, you know, you don't know. Um, I'm, no, when I say I've been blessed, I'm not being, you know, uh, facetious. I mean, I, you know, it's it so happened that I taught in very good universities where the competition to be accepted for those programs is pretty hard. And, uh, and I think it's for them to say. <laughs> I, I, there's not much. I, you know, I, I had great students over, all over the years. That's true. Um, I don't have... I, I know I'm a good advisor. <laughs> I, I would not I would not I would not deny that <laughs> because but uh, you know I'm not the only one. Um, um, I spend a lot of you know I, I, I mean they, they can test it. they can say you know things but mm -hmm. I can't. <laughs> well, I'm going to end my questions there just to say that I'm very glad for the experience of reading this book. Um, I felt like it revealed uh, many things that I hadn't fully um, understood before, including thinking about how it mirrors the, the narrative technique that it, it proposes and how it suggests something about your own thinking about historical um, and given this crowd, um, mm. we should open it up to questions. Ivo mm. <laughs> 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 uh, sort of invented a term which I think is very pertinent to everybody here, to the work of everybody here, and that term is theoretical object. Yeah. And when I think about your work, I, the, the theoretical objects that come to mind are axonometry, and non-composition. Yeah. Okay. And axonometry, of course, occurs to me as the oblique. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's uh, it's uh, that's that's was part of the part of the connotation in the title, of course. You know, it's just it's not frontal. It's uh, axonometric is always oblique, and you, you can only uh, experience it uh, in an indirect way. Absolutely, which is what which is interesting because sometimes architects who use a lot of makes misunderstanding like. Peter Eisenman made an axonometric model, which makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, that's about the only thing that's not axonometric is a model. <laughs> so, it's like it's a, and a, a non-composition that has been a, that has been a, you know, indeed a, some 
something that I coined and it just stayed and uh, has been, a, you know, one of my guiding, my guiding uh, whatever threads. But and and you know, I, I, it got very perverse when I, when I was like dealing with non-composition in Montreal. That is really that is really. Uh, <laughs> That's hard to do. Well, <laughs> he, he made he made nineteen uh, yeah, no nine nine grid grid paintings which are you know really great, really modular, and if it's modular, it's not compositional. But that's about only nine paintings, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're important. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but you're, you're right, Rosalind, to point us to those two things. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Um, I've been thinking about this, and I, I know like a fraction of Ellen's work that you do, and I may have misunderstood what you said when you said that one of the commonalities among the different artists that you worked on was that they were involved in. Well, I was I was thinking about those that are that I discussed oh, in the no, book. No. Yeah, yeah. And also says no, he was not. No, no, no. He needed, no, no. He was not. He was not interested in. You know, but. I, when people say they're, you know, yeah, he was not, he was not, uh, you know, there's this famous thing which I always loved because it was a misunderstanding of, of Elsus as well. So, you know, he, apparently Albers, he, not, he, he ran into Albers in, one, in his second show at Betty Parsons or third show or something else. And, uh, and uh, Albers would have told Elsus, which even that is a little apocryphal to me, uh, What's your color theory? <laughs> and and Elsus would have would have said, I don't have any color theory, and Albus would have said that shows. <laughs> <laughs> but but what El, what El, Elsus didn't know that for Albus, Albus did not have a color theory. And in fact, he all his work is against color theory. It's about practice, and he makes he makes he says uh, I like theories are funny, you know. Oh, and, and the, the triangle by Goethe is such a beautiful triangle, but you know, it's like it's all about theory, uh, all about practice and completely. And so when Elsa said it shows, when Albert said it shows, it might, it might actually have been a compliment. Mm, right. so, but uh, that's another story. Benjamin, you have a question. I, yeah, you, um, I haven't read the book in its entirety. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little amazed, even though I knew it, that uh, the intensity of your homage to Michael. Oh. <laughs> um, provoke me to ask the question tonight is how come that the figure that has written such an extraordinary foundational book on French modernism, the books on Kobe and Manet, uh, i.e. TJ Clark, never appears in your references? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. And um, which also points to the methodological decisions that you made that, yes, you did undo American formalism in its reductivist terms and enhanced it or complicated it with an immense range of references, Russian, Soviet, French in particular. But you never make that transition into social art history, even though it was very, very important for everybody in our generation. And Tim was, of course, a key figure for many of us. I think I can say for me, he was the, uh, one of the main reasons to return to art history after having abandoned mm -hmm. it. And I know very much that you are very engaged in historical, political, social, political questions, but somehow, in spite of the fact that these are the books on French modernism, I think much more so than Michael Fried's book on Kobe or Michael Fried's book mm -hmm. on Manet, and at least my mind, you completely well, he was, excise that from your reference system. Well, he was not part of my reference system. I discovered... Uh, Tim Clark very late. Oh. Creed invited him, right? Yeah, I know, no, I know, but so I did no, I discovered uh, Tim Clark very late. Uh, and um, probably the first probably. thing can you remember the date? Mm. No, I mean I think that the first thing I read by him was a, a not a book, but a text on Manet. That it must have appeared bef before. Uh, the image of the people, even. I, 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 there's this I read, you know, like tw 20 years after it was published. Mm. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, you imagine that a French historian would. Well, you know, the, the one thing, one thing I must say that in France, it was defended by the most 
ridiculously reactionary, uh, you know, global, you know, I mean, no global, completely dogmatic Marxists who they couldn't stand. Like, they were like the most idiotic people. It was a, it was a group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can make a list. I mean, it was just, I uh, couldn't stand these people. And it, for whom abstraction was, of course, the art of the bourgeois. And, you know, I mean, it was just it was fine. Uh, so, so, no, unfortunately, that's the image. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I didn't read him early. Because whenever you heard about him, he was always defended by people I really truly detested. So, fine, you know, it's like I should have looked at myself, you know, uh, but I was discouraged. So that's one of the reasons I read, read him late. I think that the thing, you know, the first thing I read was, I think, a, t is a text on, but is it, I don't know where, but on Olympia, before the book. In Spring Magazine. Yes, must have been that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that, that's, because Screen, I, I bought, I was buying Screen when I was, was when I was going to London. Yeah. So, um, and I was fascinated, uh, but, you know, and then, uh, you know, and then, and then uh, in, um, in America, I, I, met, I met him because Michael invited him several times to come and give lectures at Hopkins, where, where I was teaching. But it's true, he became, he became, was an early, I discovered him late, that's all I can say. And, and, um, it was not a impression, it was just accidental. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that, truly accidental, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, no, but I mean, the, the, Oh my God! This was this. No, but uh, Freed is part of your autobiography. Michael, um, Clark isn't. Well, because I'd never had any connection yeah. with him until very late, and this this is uh, really about formation, you know. And so, I read him when I was fully formed. What <laughs> 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 wish? <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I I've, I've learned a lot from 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 Tim Clark, and I've disagreed a lot, in, in, you know. But you know, it's, it's strange. I mean, why, why things uh, are available to you at certain points and, and not others? It's strange, but it's the way it is. I have another question, but I can't no? answer it. Uh, okay. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> what about the extraordinary absence of German artists from Europe? <laughs> 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 so one would imagine, given who you are, that you would love to work on Schmitters, but you never did. One well, would imagine who you are, that you would love to work on Hartfield. No, no, it is it is totally true, but that's right. also because I I am very bad with languages, and I would have to learn German, and it was like. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. They know. <laughs> no, no, they know. They are French art historians. They, even, they don't. They know absolutely no, no other language than French. I mean, that's uh, that's one of. They read Cassirer in German. Yeah, but he, you know, he, he's not exactly. <laughs> he, had to, <laughs> he had to struggle. Yeah. Let's say no. I mean, it, it's that's you know, I'm too lazy, uh, bad with languages, and you know, that's that's the only reason I would. I, but in order to study Schmidt, you don't have to have German. Right, the major important book on Twitter was written by John Elderfield at the time. Well, but you know, he has, he has himself written a lot in German. I don't, I don't know. I mean, okay. uh, <coughs> but it's true. It's, so I, I mean, I and as as a, a I think it's a no, but I was fascinated very early on more by Hartfield than by Schwitters, actually. Okay. Schwitters, my, my, my fascination for Schwitters came a little later, but but still, I've always wanted to, you know, like, uh. You know, speaking about the formless exhibition, which uh, Rosalind and I did, we wanted to have, but we, we couldn't get any. We wanted to have the, some of the sculptures, of, of uh, late sculptures of, of Schwitters. You know, we couldn't get any. Uh, and uh, as a, as a you know, professor, advisors of graduate students, I've always said, you know, why don't you work on Hartfield? Why don't you work on Schwitters? And, you know, it's hard. Yeah, but later on. And, and not as not not as a dissertation. So. Oh yeah, there was a dissertation. That's true. Yeah. No, but you know, I mean, it's a good question, and I, I, it's 
once again, it's. No, I was just asking the question of talent formation. Yeah. Well. No, I, I knew. But that was. No, but that was like Schwitters and Hot Field. Was, I remember very well, you know, the, the Ulysses Key book was published by in Dresden in 1967. And the Hot Field book was published, the big Hot Field book was published by the same press, which is like the DDR, the, like, the worst communist regime you can possibly imagine. Yeah, those extraordinary books. And, uh, and the Hot Field book was, I think, in 1969. Yeah. And I was fascinated. I went, you know, and I was, why is there one more about it? You know, and I, you know, and uh, you know, would have wanted to, if it had been, but at the time it was impossible to get other information. And, uh, so no, I mean, your, your question is why, you know, why didn't I work? Well, there's plenty of things I should have worked on. That's for sure. But, uh, no, no, it's it's I, I agree. Are there any other? I have one more. <laughs> 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 the opportunity to talk to you. So. <laughs> um, some of the French artists that I have worked on and that have preoccupied me immensely, um, Raymond Ernst and Jacques de la Blende, Pierre Doroni and Daniel Guerin, are not part of your focus either, even though you work very clearly on certain moments. I could have worked on any of them, right. in fact. I mean, this is a, it's not a game that I'm playing. It's just a no, no. question. Like, we've had many conversations about Yves Clown, who obviously has been on your mind. In well, your partly... About Yves Clown also, yeah. right? Who do you share, I guess, is the question. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. No, I mean, yeah, I could have... I could have... motivation to select for each of us or anybody. Uh, well, you know, I could have worked on Ville Glee and else, I'm not sure, but I could have worked on, on Ville Glee yeah. easily or, and on, you know, and uh, on the other, Klein, uh, that really has to do with my own discovery as a teenager. I was fascinated by him. I was not fascinated by the right wing, ridiculous, you know, all the, the costume in the Garden Imperial or whatever. That I thought was completely ridiculous. Um, but I, nevertheless, I was very impressed by the monochromes, that is true. And I still remember the exhibition very well of the, uh, the after just after, shortly after he died at the Musée des Décoratifs. I mean, I was very young then. It was, I was still, compl I was fascinated. So, I wanted to understand. Um, you know, there's, there's. I mean, you have been writing uh, very critically of Klein, and and, and your, I agree with in, in great part with your criticism, but not entirely. That is because never that he did something, and the reason I, I, that one of the, the one of the most interesting discussion that with Martin Barre. So Martin, as a young man, was basically the, the rising star of the Ecole de Paris, which is basically this post cubist abstraction, which is boring like hell. That French, they did that for the, you know trials and you know like kilometers of painting, and. Um, what changed him is exhibition of Martin, uh, seeing the exhibition of, of Klein, and because and 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 criticizing Michel Ragon, who was the, the standard art critic of the time, who had said something, uh, you know, ridiculous Klein, and and Martin said, no, 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 he's very interesting, is is much more interesting than all what we do. And after having said that, Martin lost his his gallery, his collectors, you know, like everything. <laughs> It was just uh, so clear, you know. Um, he, 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 he had all, uh, all there's all kind of things in his work and his way of thinking that I found awful, but he nevertheless had a, an extraordinary role in just like a, a big uh, pavé dans la mare, as we say in French, and that is, is something that has to be understood historically, I think. And uh, and so, but the, the, my text on Clay is not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> it will be in a, in a non-composition book if that book ever exists. <laughs> okay, after that we'll win. <laughs> um, no, I just um, there's an interesting moment in Painter's painting where Greenberg, speaking about Pollock, refers to Duchamp and said, like Duchamp, he just knocked everyone out with his arbitrariness. And I think Clark, his abstraction is quite arbitrary compared to the abstraction with which you've always contended.
Yeah, but the, so all the all the all the reverse. Uh, I mean, you, the monochrome is not arbitrary. So uh, there's there's nothing there. So uh, no, but clowns' monochromes aren't everyone else's monochromes. They're very they are performative in a certain way, right? To a point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the moment has come to congratulate you. Um, thank you, thank you. Wonderful <laughs> thank, thank you. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I realize that the book is, is a bit strange because it's really about my formation, but it's, you know. I, 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 I,